Good afternoon and good evening everybody. Welcome to today's webinar titled Reduce Costly Design Mistakes Through an Automated Approach to DFX. My name is Amit Sulmogre and I am Marketing Manager at Geometric. I will be the moderator for today's webinar. In today's session, we would like to share with you the best practices in reducing costly design mistakes and how automation can help in this journey. Our today's speaker will also showcase few examples of how best-in-class companies are saving millions of dollars with this automated approach. So before I hand it over to our today's speaker, I would like to share with you some of the logistical details related to the webinar. For audio, you can use Vivo IP, that is your computer's microphone and speakers, or dial in through telephone, and the numbers are mentioned in the registration confirmation email. All attendees will be in the listen-only mode during the webinar. At any time during the webinar, if you have any questions, you can type in in the chat window available on your right-hand side of the webinar tool. We will take all these questions at the end. The recorded version of the webinar will be available on Geometric website by next week. The link to the recorded version will be sent to you through an email. So with this, I would like to introduce you to our today's speaker, Mr. Joe Barkai. Joe Barkai is an industry veteran with extensive experience in the manufacturing sector, including automotive, aerospace, heavy equipment, and high-tech electronics. Joe helps global manufacturers assess their product development and manufacturing operations evaluate and articulate the business value of information technology investments and make intelligent strategic investments in software tools to improve operations. A senior executive with over 25 years of experience, Joe has chaired several SAE committees and now serves as a board member of SAE. He speaks frequently at industry events and has been quoted in the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, CIO Magazine, and numerous industry publications. So with this, I would like to hand it over to Joe for his presentation. Thank you so much, Amit, and thank you all for joining us today for this uh, webinar. Um, I, I think that it's uh, fair to assume that we all know why we're here, what you need to do. I'm sure that management keeps telling you you need to reduce product cost, uh, you need to improve quality, you need to short the time that you reach the market with the products, or you need to be much more agile in responding to adverse effects such as quality spills or competitive change or some other market shift. So we all know that. Uh, in fact, I was just the other day at a manufacturing conference, design and manufacturing conference, and a major uh, manufacturer um, of appliances, a European manufacturer, uh, stated their goals um, for the upcoming years. Uh, they want to reduce time to market of new products by 25%. They want to reduce uh, designing iteration and version of product by 25%. And they want to reach a state where they can say, we have zero defect products. So we, we know what we need to do. We sort of know why, why we are here. Yet somehow it appears to be very, very difficult to make the right decision. It's difficult to make decisions that allow or design that create those perfect product from the, from the first uh, go to reduce the number of design iterations. And it's worthwhile thinking a little bit in, in a different way, I guess. Why is it so difficult for us to make good designs, to make good design decisions? I think that we all face, in all industries, we face increasingly narrowing segments of customers and, and markets. We need to build products that are tailored to more specific customer sector, to more um, market sector, whether it's by geography or by demographic, what have you. And as a, as a, as a result, we see there are many, many product variants. Uh, in some industries, um, one could typify their product mix as being um, low volume uh, or many products of vol low volume each, which makes it very difficult to control the design, control the manufacturing, control the quality. So there are very many product variants in some industries. 
Furthermore, in order to meet the, for the, the competitive pressure, in order to meet customer needs, we increasingly using new technologies, new materials, new processes, and a few examples would be the introduction of composites from aerospace now into um, automotive, uh, increased use of, of resins and polymers in many products, replacing other older uh, technologies such as metal. Uh, obviously, the incorporation of uh, control software in many, many products, all the way from airplanes and cars to household products. These all make product design so much more complex. It forces us to deal with multiple domains. All of a sudden, it's no longer about mechanical engineering or electrical engineering. We need to deal with multiple domains all at the same time. We need to deal with multidisciplinary constraints when we deal when we design those products. So this really guides how, how we operate these days. We need to deal with multidisciplinary constraints and, and therefore meet decisions or make decisions that meet uh, those constraints. But there's more. I think that in most industries in the um, especially in North America, um, um, Western Europe and, and Japan, we have issues of, of aging workforce. So aging workforce, people with a lot of experience are more leaving the, the workplace. And conversely, the emerging workforce, the new generation, even though they are highly educated, they lack the experience that we never bothered to capture and disseminate and implement. So we have very knowledgeable workforce walking out the door with all this knowledge with them and the emerging workforce, the new generation, uh, again, highly educated, unable, though, to use best practices, day-to-day -day experience, what makes an expert an expert. And obviously, we all know that we never have enough time, we never have enough money, we never have enough resources to, to do the job right. So it's difficult to make a decision. There's no doubt about that. So I wanted to introduce the notion or the term of DFX, and I'll use it a lot uh, during the rest of the presentation. And I will probably use it in more than one way, more than one fashion, because for me, design for X is really a way to say we need to continuously think about multiple goals and multiple constraints when we think about any decision, certainly about design decisions. So design for X is really designed for any discipline or any constraint or any technology that you need to deal with at any one time. But let me give you some examples as well to stay somewhat academic about it. When we make, when we design a product, when we plan manufacturing of a product, we really need to understand the different aspects of the product and how they interact, how they're independent, and how one influences the other. For example, uh, how the design, design choices um, reflect on our ability to assemble or manufacture a product, how manufacturing quality impacts service and warranty, or, for example, how a modularity of the product influences our uh, ability to provide service and, and warranty, um, how we, it impacts the uh, supply chain, uh, inventory management, and so, so on. Modularity also influences installation and serviceability. And I just said supply chain, um, so how the supply chain impacts uh, our ability to meet service level goals. So many of these constraints that typically handle separately really influence each other in a very, very significant fashion. And there are many, many write-ups and, and academic materials uh, on, on the topic, and I, I guess if you search for it, you'll see a, a, a tag cloud that looks a little bit like what we're seeing in the screen. Many, many elements, many, many considerations, many, um, I guess, opinions of what are the set, a small okay, management set of constraints that we can use in order to understand the quality of our design, uh, our ability to assemble uh, or manufacture and assemble it, our ability to install it properly and then service it, and then obviously meet uh, customer needs uh, for that. Um, and what happens if we don't do that? What happens when we do not pay attention to all these different facets and, and constraints? We tend to ignore them, which is what happens often. What often happens is the impact of a bad decision or a decision that does not consider the rest of the um, constraints or, or objectives. Um, the impact of that typically happens downstream. It doesn't happen where at this point of the decision is being made or a task will be performed, but rather it happens downstream. And there, as a result, we have subpar quality, we have manufacturing issues, we, we don't meet uh, customer expectations, and so on. And often those are then, in turn, manifested in engineering change orders, or ECOs. And depending on your organization, you may call it ECN, engineering change notice, engineer change request. Each organization has different nomenclature, essentially saying we've found a problem, 
we need to fix it in, in a formal or semi-formal fashion. So said differently, ECOs, you know, I just happen to use the term ECO more than I use ECN or ECR, ECOs are a good way to assess the efficiency or even the maturity of our design product or our product development organization. So why don't we look at some ECO statistics to get a sense of what it really means, um, how, how the design issues are expressed or manifested by ECOs. So what you're seeing here is a, a result of analysis that we did um, uh, of ECOs in a very large um, industrial equipment manufacturer. Uh, to give you an idea, and admittedly this is a large uh, uh, organization, it may or may not be similar to yours, uh, this organization, this analysis of about three months worth of ECOs, they usually run about 83,000, 8,300 8, rather, 8,300 ECOs per year, and they estimate that the overall labor cost, just the labor cost handling those um, ECOs is about $40 million a year. So just imagine if we can reduce some of those ECOs. So let's look at those ECOs, and, and the analysis shows that many of the ECOs, in fact, 70% of the ECOs, as you see on the left column, are what we consider DFX related, so designed for any kind of constraint uh, that was violated. Or said differently, they represent issues, norms, best practices, some guidelines that we knew or the organization knew about before and somehow neglected to use. And, and negligence may be a strong word. They forgot to use it. They didn't know it, how to implement it. They did not have time or resources to test another option. So this analysis shows that about 70% of those ECOs are potentially um, avoidable. And even if, if we think that uh, um, reducing or eliminating all these 70% of ECOs is an aggressive uh, target, think about even reducing them by, by some smaller rate, even if you reduce this by half. The amount of, of, of savings is very significant, and recall I just mentioned the labor cost alone in handling ECOs for this company is about $40 million a year. Um, so they're a very, very significant opportunity, as this analysis shows. Quickly, let's look at another analysis. Um, another company, different size company, um, this company manufactures heavy equipment. Here the analysis is actually uh, different in the sense that it looks at larger buckets, so there are a few layers. Uh, but here you see that uh, the number of preventable ECO, ECOs potentially exceeds 80%. So 80 plus percent of ECOs could have been eliminated if we have applied knowledge we already have, if we've already, if we have applied best practices we already have. Um, to put these things in context though, and again I do not want to make promises or, or, make a, or raise expectations, uh, this company, as well as the other, tend to produce equipment that is somewhat engineered to order, somewhat configured to order. So, granted, their um, their their complexity uh, is 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 higher than uh, many companies. Their ability to apply best practices is more difficult because they have many one-off configurations. But I will come back to this point later and and argue and, and highlight the fact that even a small company, even a company that has a much smaller rate of ECOs can still reduce the number of ECOs in a very significant fashion. But let's move on. So we said that there's a great number of ECOs that can be reduced, uh, and this is only, it's not only theoretical, and, and here's nice analysis, but rather we know companies that have done that, companies that actually have implemented um, structured processes to look at all these different constraints, look at issues such as what we're looking at here on the screen in front of us, uh, assembly issues, costing, look at costing ahead of time, look at manufacturability issues, make sure that we don't make mistakes in drawings or in bombs and so on, and they actually implemented methodologies and structured tools to reduce the number of ACOs. So let's look at some of these savings. The first example here is from an automotive manufacturing company, um, and you can see that the total savings exceeds four and a half million dollars a year. And the savings come from a fairly long and fairly detailed list of different options. The number one saving element this company realized was three, through the reduction of rework. Essentially, you don't make mistakes. You don't need to redo either, either the design or the part or the tooling. So the mere fact that you reduce uh, the number of re rework it offers significant uh, savings for this company, exceeding $1 million uh, a year. There's another element that is as important and almost as large, it's a little bit harder to describe 
specifically, but overall the notion is that their, their, their analysis and their belief is that through implementation of best practices and reusing kind of design for multiple constraints, they were able to improve the engineering throughput by a very significant um, fashion. And, and the reason is that if you look at how engineers work, a lot of their work is really not core. It's really not pure design and pure engineering. Engineers have to spend time doing paperwork, doing routine uh, admin tasks, looking up information, discover stuff that should have known and readily available, but it, it isn't. They often have to redo work because it failed somewhere downstream. You have to go back and redo it. They often go through a number of iterations, whether it's prototyping or simulation um, and, and analysis uh, and so on. In fact, uh, my analysis in, in engineering efficiency shows that it's not uncommon to find an engineering organization that will admit that up to 50% of their engineering work is non-core. It's all relevant to the job, yet it's not necessary. It could have been avoided altogether, could have been automated, could have been uh, done once instead of several times. And I know the number sounds high, but uh, companies will actually show you that um, design throughput uh, can be improved tremendously by focusing engineering work on core engineering, core design, uh, and testing, and not on ancillary work. And, and back to our, our company here, they were able to save almost a million dollars by reducing the expenses on tooling, both the design and uh, retooling. Usually, that really also means that they were able to save significantly in scrap. Um, they reduced warranty expenses because the quality of the product was higher. Uh, they estimate the collaboration was more efficient and more effective, and by doing this alone, they were able to save about half a, about half a million dollars. And there's a very long list of related items. They're maybe not tangible as much, but they are related items to the overall efficiency uh, and collaboration in the workplace. So this is one example of a company that has implemented this process. Another company of a very, very different um, business sector, this is an electronic manufacturing services company. Again, similar to the other um, companies I mentioned earlier, they build in a way one-off products because it's a services, a manufacturing services company. Uh, but they implemented, again, the DFM methodology, and this is, by the way, their own uh, analysis, not my analysis. They reported to me that they were able to reduce cycle time of new design by 20%. They were able to reduce the manufacturing station space because of less work and less repetitive work by half. They were able to reduce downtime caused by errors, by uh, tool issues, and so on, by 92%. So they went from a very, very low utilization to extremely high utilization, or if you measure it the way they measure, uh, overall equipment efficiency, OEE. Um, from what I said, it's very obvious, or it should not be surprised that the, the amount of scrap uh, was reduced significantly. And what they are very proud to say is they believe that all these elements, in turn, made them a top global preferred supplier in, in, their, in their area. So they went from being rated, I guess, in the middle of the pack, or maybe even worse, to be top in their area and their customers rank them as the top global preferred supplier status. So here's, in a way, a proof of two companies that have implemented a structured process to DFM and, and they were able to save significantly. I, I, I would not be surprised if some people in the audience now look at the numbers and say, this is really too good to be true. So it's so staggering, maybe not even so believable. Because I talked earlier about $5 million of savings. Uh, per year um, for a company. So I do not mean to turn today's discussion into a kind of a design for manufacturing uh, seminar, but here's some kind of reminder of where the issues are, where the saving um, losses and opportunities are. So we talked already about design and, and engineering a little bit. We talked about the improved efficiency of, of engineering. So labor cost alone would be significant. And again, I want to recall the number I talked about earlier as far as the cost, the labor cost of just, just handling ECOs that in, in themselves should not have happened. Um, I recently spoke with the, with the company, I'm, I'm, I want to talk about the component selection for a second. I recently talked to a high-tech manufacturing company that through implementation of, again, routine processes through, uh, re, through standardization of best practices and design rules, they were able to reduce component selection by 75% which means for new designs, instead of ordering new components from new, new suppliers, 
they were able to use existing designs and sub designs and components. 75% reduction in, um, in component selection. Um, we, we already mentioned the attributes that uh, reduce cost in manufacturing, assembly, and tooling, uh, tool breakage, scrap, and so on, and the entire overhead that, that um, comes around it. In fact, when I was preparing um, for today's talk, I remember that a while ago I did some work for a test equipment manufacturing company, so they would also be classified as high tech, and they were able to reduce the ECO turnaround time from 75 days to 25 days. I still think the 25 days is way too long, uh, and this perhaps is a subject for another webinar, yet standardizing the process, providing best practices to help them identify issues earlier and provide better context for root cause analysis allow them to reduce the turnaround time for ECOs from 75 to 25 days. And just as a general reminder, and I chose to kind of put there the landwell Juran Cosmo, and I'm sure everybody in the audience knows that, to remind us how to look at um, opportunities, uh, uh, to look at savings opportunities versus cost of opportunity and how to find the right balance between investment and outcome. And part of it is really the fact that there are so many indirect and even parasitic costs that come from those wastes. Because it's not only during the manufacturing um, area where we generate uh, waste. This waste immediately gets translated into increased cost of service and warranty. Inefficient uh, service drags behind it issues around re reverse logistics, excess inventories, depot repair. It's a lot of parasitic costs that start attaching themselves once we have sub-quality product. Uh, if you are engaged in performance-based contracting with the customer, when you are responsible for uh, performance level, um, subpar quality, especially when you do not know the quality, is very dangerous because your uh, contract may be um, suboptimal. Whereas conversely, if you know the quality issues, you can probably write a better contract. Um, and overall, which is for some companies as important than everything else I discussed so far, is the brand image, the product image. Those those are all elements that are um, impacted by poor quality, and, and we need to pay attention to them. Uh, to make it a little bit more interesting, um, just before the we started the webinar, we ran a quick survey and asked companies, manufacturing companies, what do they do? You know, among some choices. What do they do in order to improve product quality, in order to be able to meet multidisciplinary constraints better than, than before? So it's not surprising that uh, everybody almost said um, they front load, this front load decision. That is, they take, uh, they make decisions about uh, not only design, but also manufacturing and um, in assembly and, and maybe even service ahead of time. But I, I guess it will be disappointing to see that um, Half of that, <coughs> excuse me, only half that rate is attributed to implementing best practices or to use knowledge-based design rules, i.e. using what they already know. So on the one hand, we know that we need to front load decisions. At the same time, we acknowledge, if we trust the, this, um, this, this uh, quick study here, is that we don't apply what we really know in order to make better decisions. So we, we get together maybe for design review we try to consider downstream elements. As I said earlier, it's very important to understand the impact of decisions on downstream. Yet we don't use the knowledge that we have. We don't use the experience that we have, again, before the aging workforce is living, is walking out the door. So how can we effectively, effectively front load decisions if we don't apply during those decisions best practices, if we don't collaborate efficiently, if we don't use design rules that we've accumulated over time? And, and I have to say that um, I was not surprised, but I'm still disappointed. The, the fewer, the very, very low number of companies that um, think that design re reuse is an important element in making better design decisions. And this is a little bit off topic to DFM and DFX, but I still want to highlight this because I know that you and the audience are interested in manufacturing and quality. We, we waste tremendous opportunity when we do not reuse uh, design and this, and when I say reuse, I mean everything from best practices and, and knowledge that we already have to designs and intellectual property and even piece parts. As it turns out, it's very often easier to source part anew instead of looking up in, in our inventory because 
as always the case is, the supplier makes it easier to search in their inventory, whereas in their catalog, whereas it's very difficult to search in our inventory or in our BOM. And, and reuse is not only about reusing parts and, and reducing inventory, although this is also a very important element. Um, but it's, it's, it's reusing the knowledge that comes from, from reuse, whether it's um, the, quality, the known quality issues in that design. Perhaps we already have the tooling um, involved in this design. Perhaps we have experience from that design in terms of manufacturing uh, yield and ramp up time, maybe a warranty cost. So reuse drags behind it or with it many, many attributes. So in a way, it's also multidisciplinary knowledge that comes with reuse of simple part. And, and I see this again and again and again. Companies are really not doing good enough job in reusing uh, design and parts. And, and perhaps one, one element that we need to consider is, is there a way to help engineers, designers, identify reuse opportunities? Can we create a structure a methodology and knowledge base that helps identify best practices. So if we present a certain design, the, the process, the system might say, we have a similar design, we should consider using it. Um, whether we need to retrofit it, we can buy it directly, or maybe it's not cost effective to do that, because cost is obviously an, an important element. So this is very fresh, this is very new. I think that the last result arrived there early this morning. I think we can continue, we can continue running this, this survey, and we're happy to, if you're interested, send us an email. We're happy to kind of report how this survey uh, is progressing. So we talked a little bit about successful companies, what these companies, what these manufacturing companies do in order to improve their uh, quality, their time to market, um, they, they, all the other goals that they need to, to achieve. And here are some of the benefits that companies are re reporting that they were able to achieve using a structured design for X methodology. And, and I think that I already touched upon all these points as far as what are the issues we're trying to address, and indeed they're reporting the successes in reducing time and cost required to achieve the quality target that they need, because it's faster to design, fewer iteration, fewer prototypes, faster time and cost to get to that quality target. Um, they, they talk about faster time to market and long di line down time, we call the um, high-tech company that I mentioned that were able to reduce downtime by 92%. And this is because we have better design. They are designed for manufacturability. Uh, we know the issues of, of the, the build, the process, uh, the tooling, etc. cetera. Um, we, we are able to reduce the number of iteration of design and prototyping. And in fact, even if we do have to reiterate through the design, it happens within the design as, in, as opposed to going from design to manufacturing to realize, so thinking we're ready for volume ramp up to realize now we're really not re ready, there are too many ECOs, take it back to engineering, etc. It happens, it happens a lot. And overall, uh, I think this approach helps us in collaboration and, and, um, and, and effective use of inspection of root cause analysis and so on. So we see all these benefits. Now, I, I can almost visualize some of you kind of sitting at the edge of the seat and say, hey, wait a second, this is concurrent engineering, right? I mean, this is what they t tell us in concurrent engineering. This is what, what we're supposed to see as a result. And I wanted to kind of talk a little bit about how I see the differences and also similarity, but can we draw different, um, to highlight the two disciplines differently? I think that in DFX we want to focus the, the goals a little bit more than the just concurrency of the processes. So concurrency is important because we, we need to consider multiple constraints at the same time. We need to front load decisions so that processes can trigger, be triggered earlier and run, in, 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 um, run concurrency. Yet I think it's more about the process itself uh, and the goals and the sheer con concurrency. Um, and I can actually refer back to the chart we should just look, looked at. Everybody knows that they need to front load decisions, but they don't have the tool to make these concurrent processes effective. Uh, and we, we do need to front load decision and validation. We need to focus on downstream goals and constraints. So just creating process in parallel is, is not enough. It's about ability to understand the impact of those decisions on downstream. So in a way, you can look at this as being concurrent and apply best known practices. 
so it's really you know in tooling we want to validate that we have the tooling from for manufacturing we want to apply design rules and, and known methods and validate the design automatically before we are ready to move on uh, we need to look at issues such as usability uh, we perhaps want to look at digital manufacturing early in the process so just to highlight this there is there are similarities between the two but we here emphasize the goals the validation and the automation of the validation much more than we, we emphasize just the fact that we need to have a collaborative session um, without having the right tools or the right information. Um, I want to briefly highlight an approach that Airbus uh, uses for, for DFX, even though they do not call it DFX, uh, but the practice is, is such. The highlight here is very, very simple. If you look across the top, there are centers of, of competence that focus on best practices, on, on sciences, and on core technologies and so on. So whether it's the flight physics or systems and tests, whether the structures, whether the payload and, or power plane, um, you could have a center, a center of excellence or center of competence for new materials or for embedded software development. And these are kind of these are the functional leadership centers. They they focus on best practices. Uh, across product and uh, across business units. They are really not by product. And this allows them to identify best practices, share them across, uh, apply lessons learned from one to the other. They are not product specific. But at the same time, um, they have engineering integration centers. Um, obviously, an aircraft is a very complex structure. And, and the process is such that you have operational areas uh, focusing on, on fuselage and cabin and wing design is a very, very different element. Um, power plant obviously is different and so on. So we are looking at kind of a matrix, uh, a matrix of influence. And they come together inside the design. So it's multifunctional design to implement those best practices across products. Uh, not all companies are able to do that. It's, it's a fairly, I don't know if I would say it's a significant effort, but it's very thoughtful effort that needs to be done. And from all my work with manufacturing companies, some companies do it extremely well and others uh, don't. And I might even add here that it's a combination of having the right tools and the right culture, or you might say having the right culture to use the right tools that allows you to take these functional leaderships and, and uh, domain leaderships. In, in my lingo, this is Airbus. In my lingo, it would be the disciplinary centers and apply them efficiently and effectively um, across uh, different product lines and, and different uh, units within the enterprise. So in a way, it's really an enterprise approach. It's not a product approach. So something I didn't tell you up to now, I didn't tell you earlier, and I, I admit it's a little bit of a plug-in for the sponsor of our, our webinar today, but they deserve it, is that several of the companies that I discussed earlier use a tool called DFM Pro uh, from Geometric. So I think that you already understand the principles. So there's really no need to go through the entire chart. But essentially, what this shows you is a framework and a tool set. It's important to have both of them, a framework, that is an approach, a strategy, and the right tools to implement a knowledge base of design rules. So it might incorporate basic design rules, uh, basic manufacturability rules, and so on and so forth. But also, it applies some process and company-specific rules so general manufacturing rules, but applied to my products, my tools, you know, what kind of tools I have, what kind of quality assurance I have, and so on. So if I do not have um, five axis CNC machine, I would not apply rules like that. Um, so the rules are generic best practices as well as applying them specifically to my product and in my, um, my product line. Um, and then those rules are applied automatically to a CAD model. So the rules are applied to the model and, and they are flagged. You know, what are the discrepancies between best practices and, and the current design? And the tool suggests might be a right improvement. So you have inconsistent, I, I think we're looking at the plastic part here. So you might say because of some design constraints, the wall thickness is inconsistent, so inadequate. Um, you run stress test and you realize you need another supporting rib and so on. So something that engineer may or may not see. And again, in the pressure of, of, um, of, of doing designs, uh, the fact that a lot of this is best practice as opposed to actual design. So 
you know, if the design is is generic, it doesn't consider the material in the in the, in the in the manufacturing process. It may not flag it. So this might look fine in one area, but if you go into one design practice in the manufacturing process, but if you go into plastic molding, then you need another um, rib, etc. So this is what this is the tool. This is the process that some of the companies that I mentioned earlier are using. Uh, in their manufacturing process. Um, so, what what do we expect? So, what we should what should we expect if we go into such a process? If we implement a tool like the FM Pro or or any similar tool, what what do we expect? And and these numbers are um, kind of averages with broad margins because it's really very very different from one uh, company to the other, from one product discipline to another, from one manufacturing process to another, uh, but these are kind of averages and ranges that we saw uh, looking at uh, a number of manufacturing companies working with some of them to analyze their ECOs uh, and look at the the, the ECO profile once the, uh, the implementation was in place. So we should expect 10 or 20 percent productivity improvement in most areas and uh, again even though it sounds high if you uh, remember that we talked earlier about companies that said that sometimes 50% of productivity is non or time is non productive, is non core. And if you think about the example of a company that uh, reduced uh, ECO turnaround time from 75 to 25 days, expecting 10 or 20% reduction or, or productivity improvement uh, should be achievable. Rework, uh, we typically see 7 to maybe 15% uh, reduction. I think, and I'll come back to this point later, these are averages. Um, so if you look throughout your product line or portfolio, you might see those numbers. I suspect that very often if you go into one product area, one line, you'll find those numbers to be very, very different. I would not be surprised if you find rework in some areas, maybe in areas where the organization does not have enough knowledge, maybe some new material, or you introduce another machine to the manufacturing process. I would not be surprised if uh, rework uh, will be improved by much more than 15%. And the same with tooling. So when you have long runs and you're used, you know the process, then improving tooling uh, and reducing scrap might be below 10%. If it's a new process, probably much more than that. Um, collaboration improvement, we talked about this and we, I think, identified the reasons why we believe that collaboration can be improved by having better context and better understanding of the issues and then apply best practices to resolve it quickly and efficiently with the reduction of um, iteration through the ECO um, management process. And again, we touched upon scrap and warranty saving. And the reason why this is somewhat small is because A, we applied some of the scrap saving during tooling and, and ramp pump time and really depending on how you count savings or how you do the accounting in your organization. But also the warranty savings are really indirect, so it's kind of um, dangerous to apply too much towards warranty, warranty saving in this area. Nonetheless, very, very significant uh, savings, and um, if you go back and look at the ECOs in your company, you can get a sense of where the areas to improve and how much savings you might expect uh, if you implement a more structured process. So with that, let's spend a few minutes on, on really how we go about implementing such a process because I don't think it's about implementing a piece of software. I mean at the end there will be some software I'm sure but it's really not about that. It's really understanding where you are in what I call the capability maturity model. Where you are in your ability to understand, manage, control, optimize your manufacturing process as perhaps expressed by ECOs but not, not necessarily. What I'm showing here is the model for capability maturity model, or CMM. It's really not a template. It's not a. Um, it's not a, the, the the textbook because um, each company is very very different in terms of the products, in terms of the design elements, in terms of the manufacturing processes, in terms of the market. So this cannot be a cookie cutter approach. But there is a standard approach to assessing where you are, assessing your maturity, and I typically divide. The, the range into five broad categories. The first one being ad hoc or some people may say non-existent non or, or whatever the term you may want to use. 
fundamentally, it, it says that we really don't, do not have a formal process. We understand some of these issues. We apply rules, kind of rules of thumb when we find them. We consult with the expert when we can identify the expert. But overall, we use it very ad hoc, uh, not, in, not consistently. And it's very dependent upon the engineer, um, their knowledge, and their tendency to use best practices, uh, even, and even the time that they have. But again, this becomes more and more dangerous as we lose people with expertise. You know, in, in some, some industries, uh, and maybe 10 or 15 years ago, it was almost okay to have ad hoc processes because we had extremely knowledgeable manufacturing people. But in some sectors, again, we're, we're losing those. So the basic level, the non-existent level, I guess it would be similar to ad hoc process. The next step we need to really take is to formalize what we have. We need to assign uh, some metrics. So we look at our ECOs to understand what are the metrics that we think are best to represent uh, our operation to help us assess where we are, uh, create foundation for uh, continuous improvement, and start defining, based on those areas, start defining rules and best practices to help mitigate some of the issues, bridge some of the gaps that we have in the process. Still, even though we start formalizing the rules, we really don't have enough in this stage. We don't have enough cross-product sharing and collaboration. We don't have enough practice, such as we saw in the um, Airbus example, where best practices are shared across all products, across all manufacturing processes. To do that, we need to start moving into more of a standard process. We need to take the design rules that they have, the best practices that we have, and start applying them formally, systematically across uh, product lines. And maybe we start with one product and we move to the other, to other products uh, gradually. But the idea is we inter we standardize those processes across all the product lines. And and when we do that, we also need to, in many cases, extend beyond our manufacturing because we need to go into the suppliers. We need to align what we can do with supplier capabilities. If you paid attention to the ECO analysis that I showed earlier, you might have caught some ECOs that were generated by the fact that we had a design the suppliers were unable to deliver. And of course, by the time, in many cases, by the time we release it to the supplier, we've already committed so many design elements and, and redoing this is very, very difficult. It's a very common ECO. And, and also when we started the process, this is the time to start thinking about how we integrate uh, our knowledge and our validation procedure with the CAD tools. Um, I mentioned earlier um, DFM Pro that actually runs on a CAD model and flags inconsistencies or even just suspicious areas that are worth a second look. And this really allows us to start managing the process. Up to now, up to now we define the components. Managing the process meaning really implementing an enterprise knowledge, enterprise-wide knowledge base of all the rules, best practices, and so on. And not only it's enterprise-wide, it's also cross products, um, cross tools. So it needs to be in together with your CAD tool, maybe with your uh, PDM, product data management tools, and so on, in order to automate the validation and the recommendation. So whereas you can now apply, beforehand you could apply those uh, individually and maybe per request, now we, we have a tool that actually looks at the CAD design and automatically validating it, recommend um, producing manufacturability report, and so on. And with this infrastructure in place, we can start optimizing the processes. We start applying more simulation and analysis tool, so it allows us better understanding of the different multidisciplinary constraints that we talked earlier about the product, so design for X element. That is, let's assess the, our design for not only manufacturability perspective, but also um, installation, serviceability, you know, the modularity of it. How does it, um, uh, how does it sit with our supply chain strategy? Because our inventory strategy may impact our ability to manufacture. It will impact our ability to handle reverse logistics effectively and meet our service level agreement. You see how the different disciplines, again, are, are also intertwined with each other. And with those understandings, we can start building uh, an ongoing process to analyze and optimize our practices. And, and something that is somewhat of a point here, but I, it's very, very important because most companies, even though they have knowledge bases, don't do that, is understanding what I call the vitality of rules. You need to not only add best practices and add the design rules, you also need to know when to retire rules that are either just stale, nobody cares about this anymore because we don't use this machine anymore. 
they may be incorrect because we discovered something, but we are unable to go back and and, um, and redo the rule. And if you go back to the informal process, uh, how often did you find someone doing using a bad practice, but nobody told them this practice that perhaps was uh, okay five years ago is no longer acceptable because it's not was proven to be inefficient, or it's in violation of sustainability rules, or it's unsafe. Nobody knows. So a, a good company, a smart company, when using DFX, also knows how to refresh the rules and retire the rules that are, are, are stale, they're incorrect, they are uh, just, they're dangerous, they're inefficient, and, and so on. So this is kind of, this, is, this might be the approach to take, if you try to think about a journey, a roadmap to implementing a design for X practice. So in conclusion, I'd like to try to summarize what we discuss and, and offer some next steps for you to consider. So, no surprise, I, I think that DFX needs to be uh, an enterprise level um, effort and it needs to be applied systematically. Um, it's very difficult to get the result that you need if you imp implement it um, kind of ad hoc from one opportunity to the other. This is not to say that you have to start from the top, it's probably not a bad idea to start in one product line or one uh, area where you feel there's greater weakness and build from that. But the goal should be to have a systematic approach to DFX, the process or the strategy, the process and the tools to, to work across the enterprise. To do that, we need to start by establishing a baseline. So the ECOs may be a good place to start. Uh, as as I, I showed you earlier, ECOs is really a good reflection of, of the quality of, of the design and manufacturing practice that you have. Uh, I would also suggest that you can also look at uh, field service reports, warranty reports, and combine them to really establish a, a strong baseline. And, and you use this to, to perform your maturity assessment, understand where are the areas where there are greatest weaknesses in the process, what are the areas that you need to improve. Not all areas are, are worth improving, and that's, I know it's not a, it's kind of counter Six Sigma, uh, perhaps. But not every area that is weak or even um, kind of noisy in terms of statistics is worth improving. The ECOs and then comparing ECOs, the ECO analysis versus the goals and the maturity model will help you understand what are the areas that are worth improving and, and how to prioritize them. And this in turn become your continuous improvement plan. What are the areas that we need to improve? Is it about uh, implementing manufacturing ability rules first? And if we do this, do we want into is it about tooling? Is it about um, plastic molding? Is it about um, final check? The ECOs will tell you where these, the ECO analysis will tell you where these, these opportunities are. And then obviously we need to establish some sort of benefit analysis, some, so, some sort of an ROI framework, because otherwise it will be very uh, difficult to justify the investment. Um, we don't have time today to delve into how to demonstrate the ROI, but I think that I gave you enough starting points uh, to, uh, to see where the cost issues are, both direct and indirect costs, both those costs and sort of the parasitic costs. Uh, these are the costs where we generate a loss, but subsequent uh, steps downstream keep adding to the, to the cost. Uh, to remind you, it's, it's about, for example, poor quality that leads to service and now subpar service keeps adding costs to this element. So I gave you some ideas where to start looking for um, ROI opportunities and some targets where, where the, the companies that we know have, uh, were able to achieve by implementing a, a process. So this would be a good achieve, um, sorry, accomplishment success. So this will be a good place to start to um, put some kind of guidelines around the, where the financial benefits might come from. And, and then there are some best practices that companies have used uh, and these are kind of more generic to tackling the problem. Um, so first, these companies tend to create um, functional uh, or disciplinary centers of competence. We saw this in the Airbus example where they are uh, centers of excellence around um, specific disciplines, around technologies, around manufacturing and so on. So this would be a good practice to, to, uh, to, to establish. Uh, to maintain and develop uh, and enhance the knowledge about uh, different disciplines in the design and manufacturing. Uh, it's not 
likely that you can accomplish all these without having software to, to do the simulation, to do the analysis and the design validation. So it's really a combination of applying uh, CAD and CAE tools as well as design validation tools to the process. Uh, we touched briefly upon the need to maintain a corporate knowledge base of design rules, best practices, but this needs to be a live knowledge base. It's not only about collecting them, but also maintaining them, make sure that we maintain the quality and vitality of those rules. And, and part of, of that element that uh, I think is critical, it's necessary in order to accomplish the above, in order to succeed, is to not only promote system and data interoperability, because we need to apply this knowledge across different processes, from, um, from the CAD to the simulation to the manufacturing processes, but also we need to think about having a, a common master data management tool and common taxonomies. Um, again, it's a little bit off topic and we don't have time for that, but the, I'm seeing way too many companies where the, there's no consistency, there's no agreement over the taxonomy. In other words, what are the parts in the nomenclature and failing modes? What are the root causes of ECOs? So when you don't have common taxonomies, the ECO analysis will suffer. You'll have way too many buckets of very, very few ECOs. The, the challenge is, as I think it was the second chart of ECO breakdown of that industrial um, equipment company that combined individual ECOs into larger buckets. So again, to allow them to uh, capture the essence, to um, identify the opportunity and to prioritize uh, the, the order in which they're going to attack those ECOs. So this is all I, I have to share with you today. Um, here's some contact information, both from the team from DFM Pro. If you get more information, if you'd like more information, or perhaps ask for a free trial of, of their TFX tool to get a sense of what it is. Um, I welcome your um, contact um, in terms of asking for the, if you want the slide presentation or um, or ask questions or comment, whether directly or, or on my blog, etc. And and Amit, I think we have five or seven minutes for for questions. So if I, I was not able to follow the conversation on the chat box, but if you do have questions, I'm, I'm happy to try and take them. Yeah, uh, Joe. So thank you, Joe. And I think uh, this was a very informative session. Now the now the questions have started uh, coming in. So so before I take the first question would like to remind all attendees that uh, they can type uh, your questions via the chat window or if you'd like to discuss anything offline uh, please drop an email to dfmpro.marketing at the red geometric global .com and we will reply back to you okay Joe so now I will I will just go through the questions let me scroll it down Okay, the, the first question is related to ECOs, uh, which you had talked about in one of your slides, uh, Joe. The mm -hmm. question is, uh, is the distribution of DFX and non-DFX related ECOs same across industries or does it differ? Okay, okay. So the, the answer in general is, is no, uh, because each, each uh, industry is, is so different. Um, so if you look at the individual causes, they tend to be different. But, and this is the important element here, first off, it's, they, often, they often appear to be different because, as I said earlier, taxonomies and terminology is inconsistent. Um, and so the distribution of the types and, and the ability to really um, call them into uh, larger buckets is, is difficult. It's different from one industry to the other. Nonetheless, I think that if, if the question was different, say, okay, how many of them are, or perhaps this was the question I didn't get the gist, uh, those DFX related versus non-DFX, I would say that the numbers that we showed are probably accurate. <clears throat> so I, I think that 60, or, or a, 60 to 80 percent of, of um, ECOs should be assumed to be um, preventable because they are kind of what we call DFX related. I, I want to be conservative and say, even though let's use a number like 80% of those are preventable, it doesn't really mean that we can prevent them because of many of the constraints we talked about. But for most of companies, reducing the 70% to 30% would be a huge accomplishment. And, and I want to, I, I like the question because it really ties to a best practice in how to implement a DFX uh, process. We talk about having to have a kind of a baseline on how important it is. I think that it's very important to look at, to search for preventable ECOs, <coughs> I apologize. We need to look for those preventable ECO in a subset of the design functions or skills. So look at 
pockets of, of weaknesses, whether it's a specific process, uh, where a specific manufacturing uh, uh, process or, or design um, discipline, or even a group of people. It's, it's hard to tell where the weakness will be. So it's sort of dangerous to average ECOs across. I would spend the time, just like those companies that we talked about earlier did, look at one ECO at a time. It's, it's, it's painstaking. They spend three months selecting those and find where the weaknesses are. And this will give you the, 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 kind of the indication where to start. So I hope it answered the question. Yeah, it does, uh, Joe. Okay, so we'll take next one. So I think there are a uh, couple of questions around the benefits of uh, DFX implementation, which you had talked about. So, so the question is uh, how to quantify the intangible or uh, and indirect benefits through DF, uh, DFX implementation. Mm -hmm. So yes, we, we did touch upon this, I think, a little bit about when we talked about indirect, the indirect cost. <clears throat> I think that some of the um, some of the other indirect costs are related to what happens post-manufacturing around warranty and service. And, and I think that I touched upon the fact that both warranty, or I should say uh, warranty service and, and service, even if it's not under warranty, uh, create many parasitic or maybe downstream costs that we need to consider uh, as having impact upon. Um, reverse logistics is one, depot repair, the need for inventory when you have lower quality products and you need to maintain higher level of service level agreement, you need to have um, higher level of, of inventory, maybe logistics become an issue so you need to move inventory closer to the point of service. So service and warranty and warranty repair are very element, uh, very important element is indirect uh, cost. The, some of the intangibles, but I can say they are not as important, is around the company and the product image and potentially the impact of market share. So it's a little bit of a stretch, but I can definitely say how improving the effect practices to improve quality and time to market has a tremendous impact on, on company and, and brand, brand image. Um, <clears throat> and, and maybe the last one that is perhaps related to this is around customer satisfaction and maybe even just thought about it, maybe even um, uh, employee satisfaction. If employees, if your design engineers are, are frustrated by having to go through design iteration, iteration after the other because the tool did not um, discover or uncover a design flow or you create what you think is perfectly manufacturable um, product and manufacturing engineer says we can't build it or the supplier says, oh, I didn't know you need that. I cannot build it for you, not for the cost I quoted. Uh, so. I would even say that uh, employee dissatisfaction might be a factor. I think again, the ECO analysis is a good starting point to weave these long downstream uh, threads to understand what is the long-term impact, both direct and indirect. So uh, the next one is an interesting question, Joe, from one of the attendees. So he's saying, uh, we already have a process of capturing design-based practices and knowledge within our organization. So not sure how is this different or better than what we already have. Oh, well, first of all, I think we need to applaud the, this company for doing that. Uh, and, and so they are one of not that many companies that do this, uh, hopefully in a formal fashion. I, I think that the opportunity for this company, I assume that this is a collection of rules and best practices in a database or, or in a handbook, and maybe you can search in it. I think that the next, if I'm right, then the next level for them is automation. So in, instead of, of using manual processes, which in a way rely on the engineer to look up best practice, to look up uh, a process to validate a design, and there may be some guidelines, why not try to um, apply those rules automatically into the CAD design? Uh, so that may be an opportunity for them. The other one I would um, suggest is taking, uh, again, look at the knowledge management element, that is, how do we collect rules, how we, do we validate, how do we vet the rules, uh, because presumably not every rule is a good rule, and in fact, a rule may be excellent rule if you look at it from a, a perspective of a person on the manufacturing floor, for example, but they may not see other elements such as uh, even safety, but certainly about compliance with some environmental uh, issues. It may not be perfectly aligned with our uh, supplier policy. Uh, we may have a better practice, but this 
line that may be in a faraway factory is not aware of, of doing that. Uh, and again, in global manufacturing, um, it's very very possible that a faraway plant uh, is using the wrong practices, wrong uh, rules and, and uh, best practices. And even more interesting, perhaps they have a best practice, but we never bothered to extract it. So I would encourage this company to look at an, a global knowledge base of, of um, best practices and design rules, uh, use automation to apply them, and as I said earlier, make sure that the rules are always up to date, they are kind of maintain the vitality of the database as it were. Okay, Joe, so I think we are running out of time, but we'll take just one last question and uh, we can wrap it up. So the question is, where are the best practices and design rules in DFM Pro derived from? Are they standardized or they are customer specific? I, I guess the, the answer is yes. <laughs> um, yeah. I, I think that the, the whole idea is to combine some best practices that are well known, so they are good design practices, what you might find in the handbook. Uh, but also apply practical experience because we know that not everything is being taught um, in the school or it's not in the uh, in the handbook in the, the textbook. Uh, and then on top of that, uh, have a layer, as it were, or refinement that is very specific to the process, to the tooling uh, and, and manufacturing capability, to the safety requirements. Sometimes they even have to do with with um, a, a local manufacturing facility. Um, even though we are now reaching more and more the ability to in some areas kind of design anywhere, build anywhere, local manufacturing capabilities will still be different. There may be a different mix between manual and, and automated, um, you know, robotic-based manufacturing. There may be different agreements uh, with the local, um, um, with local regulations. So the rules, the best practices should be still very sensitive to the specifics of that plant, of that product, of, the, of that locale. So I guess the answer is all of the above need to be incorporated in, in um, in the database and in the validation process. Okay, Joe. So with that, uh, we have a few more questions, but uh, we are out of our scheduled time and we will not be able to take those. But but uh, the attendees can expect the response shortly uh, through an email. So let me thank all of our attendees on the webinar for taking time out to listen to the industry best practices. Also, I would like to thank Joe Barkai for sharing his experience and valuable insights. Thank you all.